All right. While Dr. Maskey um, gets wired up, I'll introduce her. She is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and a child neurologist and sleep medicine specialist at Boston Children's Hospital. Dr. Maskey received her medical degree from the University of Wisconsin and completed her general pediatric residency at Tufts New England Medical Center. She received her pediatric neurology residency in pediatric sleep fellowship training at Boston Children's Hospital and she now runs the Neurology Sleep Clinic at BCH and is the Assistant Program Director for the Child Neurology Residency Program. Dr. Maskey's clinical work and research is focused on pediatric narcolepsy. She has created a hypersomnia clinic at Boston Children's Hospital where she sees children and young adults with central nervous system hypersomnia conditions from all over the world. She is an advocate for pediatric narcolepsy, promoting awareness of this condition among healthcare providers and schools, and was honored with the Outstanding Physician Award by the Wake Up Narcolepsy, a patient advocacy group for this work in 2015. Dr. Maskey currently serves as the chairperson of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and the task force for the treatment of central nervous system hypersomnias. Thank you, Dr. Maskey, for joining us today. Well, I think uh, Anne-Marie is definitely a hard act to follow, <laughs> but I will do my best. Um, so as, as uh, Claire was saying, today we're going to be focused on adolescence because really the, the crux of this problem is that oftentimes they have misdiagnoses at the time of the onset of symptoms, which tends to be in adolescence. Um, these are my disclosures. I will be talking about medications that are off-label for the treatment of idiopathic hypersomnia and klein -Levin. Um, and today we're going to be talking about sort of overview of symptoms. You're going to get that, of course, from other lectures as well. But I think I just want to put it within the lens of, of adolescence and pediatric medicine. We'll talk about the specific challenges that adolescents have in managing their condition and a roadmap to transitions. Because oftentimes when the diagnosis is made, it's already time to transition to an adult provider and what that, what that requires. Um, and some resources that might be available, and then a discussion, and this really is a discussion. So this is a breakout session. I'm hoping to get a lot of feedback or questions, otherwise it's gonna be pretty boring for both of us. Um, but accommodations, this is really important. And I, trust me, I learn just as much from you guys about what's helpful, uh, that we can all learn from one another uh, to make sure that our, our, our children and adolescents are well cared for. So in terms of uh, the onset of symptoms, I already mentioned this, but idiopathic hypersomnia and Klein-Levin syndrome typically begin in adolescence to young adulthood. We know that these are rare diseases. Um, the prevalence of idiopathic hypersomnia is probably underestimated in the literature, ranging from 0.002% to 1.5%. And Klein-Levin is just reported as case reports, so something like three to four per million patients. You know, And so I can tell you just from my clinical experience, I think these numbers are vastly underreported, but that's just what the numbers are. Um, the onset of nar or idiopathic hypersomnia is a little bit more um, clarified, at least based on the Hypersomnia Foundation Registry, which had a mean onset of symptoms around 19 years, um, but it had a standard deviation, meaning it could happen plus or minus 11 years, and that's based on self-reporting. And there tends to be a female predominance to the condition. Klein-Levin, on the opposite hand, tends to occur more early in life, so somewhere around the, the second decade of life, uh, 15, 16 years of age, and there's a male predominance. The challenges in diagnosing these conditions are primarily lack of awareness. So as Anne-Marie was sort of talking about, getting out there in any way you can to, to let people know about these conditions will help the future generations of patients. Um, specifically for idiopathic hypersomnia, there was a, a healthcare poll, and 50%, 57% of healthcare providers reported that they think they might have misdiagnosed idiopathic hypersomnia in their career, most often as depression or anxiety. Um, in, in Klein Levin, I can tell you from experience that oftentimes it's misdiagnosed as other neurologic conditions or psychiatric conditions, including bipolar disease, and in neurology, sometimes put under the label of an autoimmune encephalitis. In terms of comorbidities, I think sometimes the vast array of comorbidities that can occur with idiopathic hypersomnia 
can lead patients through a very circuitous journey in terms of trying to establish what's the primary diagnosis. So for example, autonomic dysfunction is oftentimes a comorbidity with idiopathic hypersomnia. So I have patients who've gone to neurologists, to cardiologists, and being treated for various conditions like orthostatic hypotension, missing that it's actually just a comorbidity of a primary hypersomnolence condition. Um, and then in both conditions, lack of awareness is certainly something we talked about, but lack of availability of pediatric um, sleep providers. So even if you get to uh, the point of understanding what your condition is, wait times in many clinics is six months to a year, if not longer. And then there's a physical limitation with Klein-Levin syndrome. When the symptoms are recognized, Patients physically can't leave their house to get to the, to the physician's office. And, and I would say that's where telehealth has been actually been very helpful, um, but it's not always available in every state. So my experience is more um, in narcolepsy and pediatric narcolepsy, but the parallels with Klein-Levin and idiopathic hypersomnia stand. So in pediatric narcolepsy, we always suspected that there was a, a lack of diagnostic um, efforts done early in, in the course. And this was really from uh, work that was done in the 90s. This is called a histogram to the left here, basically showing the frequency of uh, when symptoms were reported. Um, in light gray is the time of reporting of symptoms at diagnostic onset, so when symptoms started. And in black is when the diagnosis was actually made. So you can see that the light gray peaks are coming between the ages of 10 and 20 years of age. Um, so that's when the symptoms started. But in black is when the diagnosis was made. And that's not until the third or fourth decade of life. So there's a real decoupling, right, a diagnostic delay. And we followed this up, actually, with a survey through um, uh, the Unite Narcolepsy group, which included Hypersomnia Foundation and Wake Up Narcolepsy. And just to see if this was still the case, that was data from the 90s. And we found that through that survey, nearly a third of patients were still saying that it took 10 years or more to reach a diagnosis. Your childhood is lost at that point. So that's a really important thing for us to know and, and focus our efforts to the pediatric providers. So an effort to kind of improve awareness and um, screening of uh, both idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy, we created this pediatric hypersomnolence screening tool. And this is a survey that we developed through focus groups, kind of just like what, what this group looks like today, of patients who've gone through a diagnostic journey. And we asked them questions about what were early symptoms that you had that you wish someone had noticed. We asked their parents the same questions, and we even asked their teachers the same questions. And we got this really global impression of what does a patient look like, both from their internal you know, symptom and as well as how do they look to others. And then we developed that survey and we validated it with three other sites, including Geisinger Medical Center or Dr. Morse's. We came up with um, a more smaller a number of questions and validated it. And for the condition of idiopathic hypersomnia, which is to the right, we created a subscore. And it, based on that subscore, it had a very good accuracy for predicting who might have idiopathic hypersomnia with a sensitivity 89%, meaning we're capturing um, at least 90% of the people who have it. But it's not very specific, 70%. So it might include people with other sleep disorders, for instance. So in any case, what that means to the community is that the, this is a useful resource, at least for the pediatric group, um, to be able to share with schools, to be able to share with healthcare providers, to really start screening for these types of conditions, and then more directly referring them to pediatric sleep providers. And so we hope that this can be implemented and it's being translated in a bunch of different languages now um, so that we can reduce that diagnostic delay. The other really limitation we have for the diagnosis of these conditions, idiopathic hypersomnia and Klein-Levin, are the lack of really good objective tests. I think you guys know this. Doctors love objective tests. Objective means like concrete testing that can you know, show you something <laughs> that's uh, you know, different than the subjective complaints of a patient. 
you can fault us for that, and there are many faults for that <laughs> mentality. But it does make it very difficult to make the diagnosis as a result. So for idiopathic hypersomnia, there's three different ways, essentially, you can make the diagnosis. You can use an actigraphy watch. An actigraphy watch is a, like, kind of like a fancy Fitbit. It's a measuring um, sleep-wake patterns from movement. The problem is that a number of these devices have gone out of business, and so they're not really available to physicians to use. Second problem, they're not reimbursed, so meaning physicians might want to use them, but they don't get uh, money back for them. And these devices can be up to $1,000 each, so when they're lost, it's a huge loss for that clinic. But basically what that, that testing would show is if people are sleeping more than 11 hours regularly across a week period, um, that could be used for the diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia. Now the problem in adolescence is that kids have to go to school and they oftentimes can't sleep their normal uh, sleep duration that they would want to sleep. And so you have to wait until they're in uh, you know, summer periods or vacation periods to capture that, and that sets you up for yet another diagnostic delay. The multiple sleep latency test, if this group hasn't heard, I'm sure they will hear. This is a test we use for narcolepsy, and it's been applied to idiopathic hypersomnia really without any validation testing. But it's a convenient test because we know it and we can do it. Not great, but basically what that means is what we're looking for is this cutoff score of eight minutes. Do you fall asleep within eight minutes across these five naps or not? Do you have two or more sleep onset REM periods? Because if you do, it's narcolepsy. If you only have one, it's idiopathic hypersomnia, and there's no gray zone in between. That's just the way the criteria are set up. Um, and so people fall in that gray zone all the time, all the time. And sometimes patients have long sleep type, so they sleep 10, 11 hours, but they're not that sleepy once they wake up. They have all the other symptoms, but they're not that sleepy. Um, this test is not gonna capture that because they have to wake you up to do the testing, so now you're restricted to an eight hour period of sleep, and you're not really able to show your 11, 14 hour uh, amount of sleep you need. So in some labs, you can do an extended polysomnogram, and this is a specific request. You know, labs are not set up to do long sleep study testing like this. You have to get another tech, you have to you know, coordinate things. It's not a standard test that can be billed for. So it's heavily resourced without funding. That's not gonna be super exciting for any provider to do. But in a perfect world, if someone came in with idiopathic hypersomnia symptoms with long sleep time, you would have an extended polysomnogram for 24 hours to capture that long sleep duration and meet the diagnosis. In Klein-Levin syndrome, there are no objective tests. There have been EEG studies that have been done that just basically show people are sleepy or asleep <laughs> um, during wake periods. And uh, little things like the amount of theta activity or bursts here are really nonspecific. And then they've also done 24-hour polysomnograms, which just confirm the sleep. So really nothing, um, it's a clinical diagnosis, meaning it's symptom-based. So I just wanna highlight this um, for people in the audience with Klein-Levin or, or affiliated with the foundation that as of last week, there's a new change in the diagnostic classification for Klein-Levin. Um, so there's something called the International Classification of Sleep Disorders. The last version was published in 2014. And now there's text revisions to that that were just published. So before, um, the, the requirement was having these bouts of Klein-Levin, this hypersomnia bouts with uh, cognitive changes and behavior changes that were two days to five weeks. Now we recognize that symptoms can be much, much longer, and so they just said several weeks. They're not putting a, a <laughs> time frame necessarily on it. The recurrence still has to be at least once a year or you know, at least 18 months. And then they changed the cognitive um, and behavioral components to it. So classically, um, physicians are trained to recognize hypersomnia with hyperphasia and hypersexuality. And if you don't have it, uh, it can't be Klein-Levin syndrome. But really, there's a whole broad range of behavioral and cognitive things that can be occurring. So the new uh, revisions really encompass that. So you can have cognitive dysfunction, meaning memory problems, slowed thinking, um, derealization, you know, the classic sort of, I feel like I'm in a dream or having an out-of-body experience, major apathy, like lack of motivation or um, you know, that type of behavior, or disinhibited behavior, like the hypersexuality, but they also specify could be like regressive behavior acting childish or you know, other kind of things like that. 
So we do hope that this encompasses the symptoms a little bit better and can make the diagnosis quicker. So I'll just pause there to see if anyone has any questions, because like I said, discussion. <laughs> yes. Um, so I was on a panel um, with uh, a number of hypersomnia experts around the world, um, which included um, David Plant um, and Isabella Arnolf um, and uh, a couple of other people. But yes, yeah, so it was an effort from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine to put together experts from around the world and build better consensus. Thank you, because that really does reflect a better definition of Yeah. I think so too. I just want to say thank you for that new updated because that may, the prior definition prevented diagnosis in my son at least. I know. Oh, really? Yeah, well, I, you know, even in talking with the fellows on a daily basis, you know, they're like, oh, I can't be this because that, you know, and, and that kind of thinking is what gets us to problems for sure. Multiple sleep doctors actually wouldn't agree to diagnosis because the old criteria included the hypersexuality and hyperphagia. Right, right. So um, in fact, you know, it, it, the problem is because it's such a rare disorder, we really are relying on very little and scant data to make these kind of diagnostic criteria. But I think in, um, in, in the studies, hyperphagia was only like 40% of the patients. You know, while it might be kind of like easy to remember <laughs> per se, and kind of goes along with maybe a hypothalamic dysfunction, it doesn't happen that often. And I'm also happy that you put the cognitive dysfunction higher than the other stuff because at least in my son, I believe that's the case as well. Yeah. I think there's one more. Hi. Um, my question is, how do you push away the older definition, given that the information is still so prevalent and out there, yeah. such that patients don't I, continue that's a great to question. get misdiagnosed? I think that it's something that, um, you know, as, as medical content people, we just have to keep reiterating the changes. Um, through this meeting, there's going to be an ICSD three revisions panel discussion group, I believe, on Tuesday. And that's really to push everybody to recognize the changes, but it is like coupled with <laughs> all the other sleep disorders, but they'll highlight some of these important changes. But I would say, you know, from the foundation and whatnot, they're really, I think these are things that really need to be emphasized to the community. Um, I would hope that when people like Anne Marie was saying would do their Google searches, that they'd recognize the broader symptoms. Um, you know, that, that these would be updated in, in those types of social media talks too. Great, thank you. I'm gonna find you offline. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but for me personally, the original definition fit my son to a T. So yeah. had I not had X, Y, and Z, I would have been lost. So to get rid of it completely, I think is actually doing a disservice to the community. I think it should be a combination of both. Yeah. And it can, maybe the verbiage can say, some, all, none, you know, however, yeah. get, I, I, I completely disagree with getting rid of the first part. I think it's not fair to the community because there is a very, whether it's 40%, 20%, 10%. The hyperphagia component? Hyperphagia, hypersexuality, so it's actually all that percent now, it itself. Yeah, so the eating disorder is not one of them, but it is described under the disinhibited behavior in the text. So there's the text revisions mean we also... Right, but for my son, per se, like that was one of the big... Yeah, a component. He just ate the same food over and over. Yeah, when he yeah, was yeah. awake, that was it. So hyperphagia for him, when we looked it up and said constant binging of the same foods spewed out KLS. So when yeah. we were in the ICU and we presented it to the doctors, they said, you're not the one in a million. It's not what it is. And everyone fought me. But I, you. like Dr. Ann Marie said, uh -uh, <laughs> I'm not accepting no. And I kept fighting. Yeah. But I, I'm like, I'm horrified that those decisions or those topics would be removed. It should be a combination of Yeah, both. I should just add, nothing's really removed per se. It's just um, collapsed into broader categories. So, you know, I think the the... <laughs> In the descriptions, they do have the listing of hyperphagia and anorexia and the frequency of symptoms. But uh, your point's well taken. OK. Thank you. Yeah. I have one follow-up question. Um, 
I'm part of the, the KLS Foundation and uh, serve on the board, and one of the things I was responsible for was um, you know, putting in place our patient registry. And our registry collects a lot of this information on, you know, on symptoms that patients experience. And my question is, um, is like, the medical community aware of our registry that we have this you know, um, you know, collection of, of helpful information that we could potentially provide to you know, practitioners such that we can be as accurate as possible with these type of definitions? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm aware of your registry. I would say on a personal level, it's, uh, I don't see that many patients. And when I refer them to the registry, they're, they're like, oh, yes, for sure. And then <laughs> they forget and, and you know, whatever. But um, it's something we should talk about. I think that there, there's a room for improvement there. It seems Especially, like there could be like a real practical practical function. Especially when there's changes like this, I think there's a shared interest to make sure everybody's on the same page. Great. Okay. Um, can you take another question at this point? Um, the microphone also is for the online community. That's why I'm making sure everyone does it. Well, good morning. Um, I'm very happy with this because, well, my son has different things. But I'm going to bring it up again, and I know I brought it up yesterday, but why are we not saying anything about taking a test to figure out what their hypocretin level is? I am so confused about this because well, I can, can I that. just yeah. ask, tell you one thing? Yeah. My son cannot pass a sleep test mm. because he does have KLS. Thank you. I love you guys. <laughs> we confirmed that yesterday. He has KLS. But he also has zero hypocretin. Oh. I know. Okay. And you're amazing. <laughs> and you're saying, oh, do you guys get what I'm saying? I'm saying to you that he definitely has zero hypocretin. He definitely did, could, like, went from 75 pounds, slept 22 hours a day, could not get up, has every single thing on that list. And because I'm a little cray cray, we took us two years. But if someone would have given him that test, we would have known earlier. Yes, it hurt. Yes, it was painful. But please understand, it's more painful to wait six years. Mm -hmm. So is why is it son... not even on your list of something to figure out narcolepsy? Right. I'm sorry. I'm so passionate about this. No, it's great. Um, is, is your son have periods of these hypersomnia and normal in between? There is nothing normal. Okay. So he has had sleep. times where he doesn't remember for a while. He has had years where he is in an episode. He was not able to go to high school. He has hallucinations. I mean, he is so both that until yesterday, we have one psychologist who said he's Klein Levinen, and then obviously, thank God for Dr. Mignot and his, their team, we were able to get him the test. Mm -hmm. So now we know for sure he has narcolepsy, mm -hmm. but he has every symptom over here. The eating, we laughed about one of the young ladies, the, my sister and I were the papers of all the candy underneath, the, being a little kid at times. Yeah. Like he has every single part of both. Yeah. But well, I think we should that's definitely, okay. I think, talk offline. But I mean, if the patient has hypocretin deficiency, it's narcolepsy type one. And that's in the narcolepsy slides, which I'm not showing you here. Oh, yeah. And then patients with idiopathic hypersomnia and Klein Levin, at least based off of studies that have been done don't have, they have normal hypocretin levels. There have been reports, however, of uh, people with Klein Levin during their episodes having lower amounts of hypocretin or orexin, and then going back to normal in between. So your son sounds very unique, <laughs> frankly. No. Yeah. I mean, but I know he's unique, and you don't have to, you don't cater to unique, trust me. But my question is, you can cater to we have something like narcolepsy, and we have something that I know is a difficult test, but how quickly can we diagnose someone with something that we know for sure? We know all about hypocretin, 
But when I talk to many people in this room, they have no idea. Oh, how do I get the test? Where does it come from? Oh, there's a test? Oh, there's, I know there's a blood test. It says maybe. So I just feel the education of that we do have a spinal test. Yeah. No, you're, 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 t you're saying it to the right people. I mean, I think that there's ongoing educational efforts. And it sounds like, you know, sometimes I think, oh, gosh, I've done this like four times this month. Like, how much more <laughs> could people want to really hear about this? But it's really helpful to hear that, you know, the education is very much needed. And I think it's also where we're talking to. You know, we might be talking to our own sleep providers, but we really should be talking to pediatricians or psychiatrists or other groups to, to get that message out. Yeah, emergency rooms. Emergency rooms, yes. That's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we have one more from KLS over okay, here, if that's sure. okay. <laughs> I was just going to ask, um, oh, sorry. In terms of ICD classification um, beyond hypersomnolence, do we have a KLS ICD-10 code? Are they going to um, update that? I know it's mentioned in the DSM-5 TR. Yeah, that's a good question. I can't remember it off the top Are of my head, but there's a periodic hypersomnolence code. Um, and then in this management, in the ICSD3, they'll give the codes and all the linked codes. So there is. Thank you. All right, so moving on to management, I think, you know, in terms of medications, the, the uncomfortable truth is that there are no FDA-approved medications for pediatric idiopathic hypersomnia or Klein-Levin syndrome. So welcome to our world. We're always using off-label medications at our own risk, without any data, and then trying to argue with the insurance companies about it. So um, in terms of what we use for idiopathic hypersomnia, there are some medications that have been reviewed by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine practice parameters and based off the literature assigned recommendations um, based on the quality of the evidence. So that's different than, say, FDA approval, right? It's not just that it's approved by the US, it's that there's some evidence for it. So those are marked with little stars here. So at least in the less than 18-year-old group, um, for adults, methylphenidate amphetamines are considered traditional stimulants, have been reported to have some efficacy in adults with idiopathic hypersomnia. So as a result, we're oftentimes using those medications for children. They're easily available. Um, they're generally inexpensive, so we don't get too much pushback, assuming there's availability. Um, and we have comfort using them because we oftentimes treat children with ADHD with these medications. Second line is usually modafinil or armodafinil. These are um, wake-promoting medications that work in a slightly different way through the dopamine system, we believe. This is not approved for people under age 17. Um, that's because there were a few case reports of psychosis and a very dangerous rash called Steven Johnson syndrome, but very, very rare. Um, but it can be helpful for daytime sleepiness. Um, but if you have a female, which again, again, the IH can be female predominant, if they're on hormonal um, birth control, it can reduce the efficacy of that and um, also can be potentially teratogenic. So these are the, the kind of warnings we have to give patients. And in both of these uh, medications, we're monitoring any mood exacerbations, um, weight changes, headaches, blood pressure changes, and suicidal ideation, because those are known risks. In terms of other medications, um, sodium oxabate um, did receive a recommendation from the American Academy of uh, Sleep Medicine based off the quality of evidence, and that came before the low sodium oxabate um, study uh, that was done that basically showed clinical efficacy in idiopathic hypersomnia for adults and received FDA approval. But this is a medication that we're using, again, off-label for our pediatric patients when the wake-promoting medications are not working. It does require some education that I'll go through in a second, and it's part of a safety program. Basically, the major counseling in here is that they cannot drink alcohol when they're taking this medication for the risk of death. Um, Pitolisant is a histamine-based medication. We know antihistamines make you drowsy. Histamine agonists, functional agonists, make you more awake. 
and there's an ongoing adult clinical trial for idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, and then medications that modulate the GABA neurotransmitter. These are the neurotransmitter GABA is, that promotes sleep. So these medications that either modulate it or act against it have been used for uh, idiopathic hypersomnia in adults. And at least clarithromycin, there's some clinical evidence of support. Um, so these are just a listing of medications that we oftentimes are trying in the pediatric group. Um, in terms of non-pharmacologic management of idiopathic hypersomnia, oftentimes naps are not helpful for patients, unlike in narcolepsy where they're very helpful. So, but if they are, you know, we'd be writing those into the 504 plan of, a, of an adolescent or a child with uh, uh, IH. Um, oftentimes sleep inertia is the biggest problem for patients. They just can't get up and get going, so they're oftentimes tardy or late for school. So writing for a later start time for school or at least building in some blocks like a study hall period where if they miss it, the consequences are so high is going to be really important. And then accommodations such as stop the clock breaks if they're feeling drowsy, extra time to complete projects so they can prioritize getting sleep and not have to be sleep deprived, and being able to do things like get up, walk around, fidget spinners, which are oftentimes taken from kids in, in classes these days, drinking cold water. All of these things are what we consider accommodations to help them maintain alertness. Um, I oftentimes get the question, can they do X, Y, and Z sport or whatnot? And activity is really encouraged because obesity, unfortunately, is something that is quite frequently occurring in patients with both narcolepsy and idiopathic hypersomnia. And a newer resource we now have is something called cognitive behavior therapy for hypersomnia. This is available in specialized sites. But um, basically, these are trained psychologists who understand hypersomnia and hypersomnolence disorders and can provide you know, behavioral techniques to improve both uh, symptoms, but also the, you know, talking about psychosocial support, coping with this very difficult condition, how to manage stigma, and how to be a self-advocate uh, for symptom management. In terms of management of Klein-Levin syndrome, it's really avoiding precipitating factors. Um, which sometimes are completely unavoidable, unfortunately. But you know, things like alcohol use, marijuana use are important counseling uh, aspects and trying to make sure that sleep deprivation is not you know, ongoing. In terms of medications, there's really very little on pediatric efficacy for Klein-Levin syndrome. But borrowing from the adult literature, medications like amantadine um, have been reported to be helpful. Um, but in my experience, it can be helpful for a couple of days, and then it seems to worsen the agitation or anxiety associated with it. So then we stop it. Um, Off-label medications, such as valproic acid or lamotrigine, uh, these are anti-seizure medications that are used for bipolar disease, actually. Um, and we think it might be helpful in terms of some sort of internal regulation process. But it only has about a 40% efficacy, so less than 50% of people benefit. Lithium did receive a conditional um, approval from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine based on some quality of evidence. But it, it, it did improve disease severity and the quality of life of patients. But it has a very high side effect profile, tremor, which can really uh, affect people's writing quality, increased urination, uh, diarrhea, and hypothyroidism. So it requires very close uh, monitoring, blood monitoring, almost every four to six months to make sure that uh, things are stable. More recently, IV methylprednisolone. So this is uh, IV steroids. There was a clinical trial, an open-label clinical trial in France that used this. And they used it for three days um, when the symptoms first started. So the efficacy was much better if you got to the patient within the first 10 days. Um, and then it, it did reduce bout duration. So they described that as less uh, reducing bout duration by one week. And the bouts were less frequent by one less bout. Um, however, uh, insurance might not cover this. It's very inconvenient. The last patient I had, we had to bring by ambulance <laughs> to the hospital because they're hypersomnolence. You can't move them. This patient was so heavy, the, the family couldn't physically get them in the car. So this can be quite difficult. And then there's some case reports of IVIG. This is Im immunoglobin product, blood product, with the idea that um, there have been some reportings of what's called an HLA association with Klein-Levin, um, suggesting that there might be an autoimmune basis. So people have tried 
IVIG, um, which is a therapy for autoimmune diseases. And there's some case reports of its efficacy, but this is much more costly than even steroids, um, and so can be quite difficult to get approval for. And in terms of non-pharmacologic uh, management, the, you know, I think this goes without saying, obviously patients are sleepy um, and oftentimes just physically can't leave the house, but you know, even I have patients sometimes who are like, oh, I was 50% better, so I want, drove to school. <laughs> and it's like, you're still sleepy, you're still affected, you really should not be operating any kind of machinery until you're fully back to normal. Um, in general, I counsel families to just let the, the patient sleep because sleep is really something that if it's disturbed, it seems to make the situation almost worse or longer. So um, that's important to write into the 504 plan so that you know, the work's not accumulating. Um, tutoring might be needed. We went through some of the cognitive aspects of what happens in Klein Levin. And sometimes what happens is the hypersomnia improves, but you still have those lingering cognitive effects. So tutoring might be needed when they're returning back to school to help them both catch up, but also they might need some extra assistance. Um, providing a safe environment, um, sometimes paranoia and anxiety are things that can sometimes happen during Klein Levin, and you want a really simple routine, no new people uh, to exacerbate that, that might exacerbate that situation. And then recovery, um, there's some new data suggesting that um, there's a high reporting of mood disorders even when patients are back to their normal baseline. And that might be just the trauma of missing so much school and, and you know, friend and social time and that everything's continued without them. Um, so I think that's something to, important for people to have on the radar. There seems to be a higher association of these mood disorders if they had longer disease duration, more psychiatric symptoms during the KLS bouts, and were female. Um, and then even between the bouts, we talked about going back to normal, but really it's normal or near normal <laughs> because many patients, especially as they acquire the disease over years, start having cognitive issues even in between the episodes. Um, and that might require ongoing treatment. So I have a, a couple of patients who we continue their stimulants or put them on stimulants or amantadine even between bouts to help them function. Um, I think in terms of what we can do for our teens uh, is, is really important. I think just as Anne Marie so eloquently said, is just listening is so important. This is a group with a rare disease and no one knows what they're talking about. You know, there's no objective tests. Um, you know, it really makes it very difficult. And um, sometimes they, oftentimes I should say, they don't get the support from school. Um, and so you're really providing education, but they're going through the process of all of this. Um, so listening, I think we're fortunate to have a cognitive behavior psychologist who's on staff for us who can do hypersomnia-focused um, counseling, but this is not something that's always available to people. Um, I think, importantly, we have to make sure that we listen to when the symptoms are, especially for idiopathic hypersomnia. If symptoms are early in the day, it might dictate how we you know, use medications, immediate release medications, for instance, might be more helpful for someone with sleep inertia than long acting. Um, and then monitor for signs of depression, anxiety, substance abuse, which might be self-medicating because you, know, you have a terrible condition and you're depressed. Um, and then having honest conversations about risk-taking behavior. So alcohol use, um, drugs, sexual relationships, these are really important things to know about because the medications can be dangerous if, uh, if they're used in combination and sometimes reduce efficacy of birth control, um, putting them at risk. Additional accommodations um, for both groups really are, you know, uh, especially for idiopathic hypersomnia, priority re uh, registration is really important so that they can pick classes that are later in the day and sleep what they need to, especially if sleep inertia is a problem. Um, many of these college courses are like boom, 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 you have a class, class, and then a lab. And so being able to um, space them out can be helpful. And then making sure that we have appropriate dorm requests, especially if someone's on an oxabate. Um, these are really important things to make sure it's communicated that a patient's on oxabate, that they're next to an RA or someone who could help them if there was a fire alarm or an emergency in the middle of the night, that their dorm room's on the first floor or near the um, bathroom so that if an emergency, they can get help. Um, so I'll pause there just to see if anyone has 
uh, questions about accommodations or things that you guys have found to be helpful? Um, I actually do have a question online. Um, so I'll read that. I'm curious if you have any research on KLS symptoms while taking Zywave. My son started Zywave in January and it was great. And then in February, we think he started with seasonal allergies and that triggered a KLS episode. But it wasn't nearly as deep or as horrible as usual. He was asleep 16 to 18 hours versus 22 hours. But the six to eight hours awake, he was more alert and cognitively together. Not at all normal, but not as as usual as KLS level. Do we think this could be KLS on Zywave? Oh, I have I don't know. That's <laughs> all of what I would say. <laughs> okay, but thank I you. think that that's that's a very unique situation. Um, yeah, it's it's worth looking into. I mean, the first thought I had is like sometimes there are rare um, metabolic disorders that cause um, increases in Zywave concentrations and could produce sort of a hypersomnolence kind of things. And there's also medication interactions that could potentially increase um, your Zywave levels. Okay. So uh, probably would need to know a little bit more. All right, thank you. Anything in the room? Okay, Lisa. So quick question about the um, delays for diagnosis. So in regards to those um, delays, has there been an effort to reach out to patients and parents who have received a confirmed diagnosis on how they described their symptoms as children? And has that been shared with pediatricians to potentially decrease that amount of time between symptom onset and yeah. diagnosis. Yeah, I mean, not for Klein Levin, but at least we did include that group in the development of the pediatric hypersomnolence group, which um, again was surveyed with with um, focus groups and whatnot to find out those symptoms. But you know that that the focus groups were mostly narcolepsy patients, and so you know while we do have some representation of idiopathic hypersomnia, probably more could be done to build out that sub scale that I mentioned. Yeah. Um, but it's a it's a great point. I mean, I think too for Klein-Levin syndrome, that's something that would be interesting. Um, to survey the patients themselves to find out how they were feeling, if they can recall that, to see if any kind of surveys could be built out for, for that too. You mentioned the uh, uh, diagnosis of the extended sleep hours, and um, I, I have had several sleep studies and none of them took into account the, the extra sleep hours. Could you talk a little bit more about kind of talking to the providers about, yeah, please do this for me? Yeah. I, yeah, I think that you have to be aware of the limitations, so it sounds like you are. Um, and it's, it's a request to the provider, just as you said, but really I think the point is you're wasting your time and their time by just going through the same PSG MSLT if there is no extension of hours. So all I can say is in our lab what we do is we just have, um, uh, instead of booking an MSLT, we have the, the technologist just you know, come in for the <laughs> extended portion. So the first technologist has to leave by seven, the second technologist comes in at seven, like it was an MSLT day, and just continues running the test. So it's easy for them because they don't need to do anything, <laughs> right? There's no protocol, they're just letting a patient sleep. Um, and so in terms of resources, it's, it's available, the problem is the billing component. So that's where you know, they're not going to be able to bill for an, ex there is no such billing for an extended polysomnogram. And, and they can't work one out with the insurance company. I mean, it just can't happen. They're not gonna get paid. Generally speaking, yeah, we operate at a loss. Okay. Um. But I mean, it's, I think part of the problem is we're at such an early phase of um, these types of tests. I think that they're, critically needed, but what's really lacking from a literature standpoint is how much sleep duration, because our data comes from France where they have a research study lab, and so the long sleep times that have been validated, the cutoff is 19 hours after doing a 32-hour extended polysomnogram. 
No lab <laughs> can do that. No lab can do that. Yeah. So really what we need to do is find, you know, like what's the sensitivity and specificity of 12 hours, 14 hours, and then come up with a more reasonable extended polysomnogram and then, you know, pitch it to insurances. What are they looking for? Is it differences in the EEG or? Uh, no, it's just, it's literally quite, literally sleep time, total sleep time. Want to see how long I'm sleeping. Yeah. Okay. And, and that opens up the next can of worms of, well, why can't we do this in the home? And it's because the devices aren't well validated. And, you know, it, maybe in like next year, Houston will have a different conversation. But that's quite literally where we're sitting today is that, um, Things like the Fitbits and whatnot haven't been validated for idiopathic hypersomnia and this long sleep time. But I, I will say, like, I work with um, uh, a junior colleague, Maggie Blattner, who's working on developing validation, actually through an ASM grant, <laughs> um, of home testing using a, something called the Sleep Profiler, which is an EEG-based um, ambulatory device. So I'll push her to get some data for Houston. <laughs> All right, anything else? Yes. Uh, just a quick question as far as like for IH. I, I kind of walked in. I walked in a little late. Um, when you're working with pediatric patients, when did you, how early are you seeing some of these patients present as far as Yeah, I would say idiopathic hypersomnia. Maybe the youngest is like 12, 13 years of age, but it is in the second decade of life. When I see them younger, there's always something else. They have autism, they have epilepsy, they have, you know, so it might be hypersomnia due to, you know, a psychiatric condition, medical disorder, or whatever. They might fall into that group. But I would say pure idiopathic hypersomnia with, you know, the kind of sleep inertia and the recognizable symptoms that we appreciate tends to be more in the adolescent period. Thank you. Andrew, Andrew, someone behind you. Do you see comorbidities with KLS as well? I'm sorry, could you say that again? Do you see comorbidities with a KLS as well? Um, I think what we see is that cognitive dysfunction, mood disorder, um, in between the bouts as, as the comorbidities, so almost like an ADHD type profile or some kind of cognitive issue in between the bouts, um, and then depression or anxiety but I don't see like any other medical comorbidities. Um, I have had a couple of patients with things like pandas, um, you know, other autoimmune flavor to them, <laughs> which is interesting, um, but I, I don't, I, you know, there's not a huge robust literature to, to, to suggest that as a true comorbidity. Thank you. All right. Um, okay, so last transitions. And I say this because <laughs> I wish that our patients are just so much better prepared because it is a very cold day <laughs> when you, know, you get that call from insurance saying that you can't see your provider anymore um, and you have to go see X, Y, Z. So this is a big movement within pediatrics to sort of prepare people with chronic diseases uh, for this transition. And there's the inherent vulnerability, of course. You know, I, I don't want to go through it, but you can imagine. But you know, if you stop your medications, you're at risk for medical complications. If you don't have a follow-up visit, you're going to have suffered discontinuity of care. Um, if you can't recognize you know, how to advocate for yourself or you know, your symptoms or any side effects, that's gonna limit your relationship with the next provider. You might not get the quality of care you deserve. And then we know that this population, adolescents to young adults, they engage in more risky behaviors. So this is a, you know, something where if, if appropriate ad, you know, guidance is not provided regularly, they're at risk for ER visits and hospitalizations. And this is a survey where basically just, this was a chronic disease um, patient parent group where they had surveyed these patients and 83% of parents of children with chronic diseases said that they were not prepared for this transition to adult care. So what you can do um, between ages and 12 and 16 years, we do try to make more effort to have uh, visits with the patient alone without the parent there, or at least give them some opportunity to communicate without the parent there. 
This is getting harder and harder, frankly, because our visits are shrinking. So we used to have an hour long visit, then it's a 30 minute visit, now it's a 20 minute visit, and now it's a hybrid of telehealth in this. So it takes effort, but what I would say to parents to do is if you have a concern about your child, email the provider beforehand so they have that awareness that there is a concern and then make time, then they can make time for it ahead of time. Um, you know, we don't wanna hear that we had this nice visit with the parent, patient and we engaged and we did all these things and then you get an angry email from <laughs> mom or dad later saying like, I told them to tell you this and they didn't do any of that. Um, they're learning. So, uh, and then between 16 and 18 years of age, we expect them to start being able to summarize their own medical information. I have Klein Levin, this is what I've tried before, it didn't work for me, these were the side effects I had, um, things like that. They also have to start looking for adult providers in their area, even this early, because um, many adult sleep providers also have long wait times. Um, so it could be up to a year, so we, we wanna prepare for that, right? Um, you know, the, the potential changes to insurance. So some insurances allow you to stay with your pediatric provider until 25 years, and some hospitals allow that. Ours allows us for 25 years, uh, we can take care of them, but then after that, they have to find a new home. Um, so these are important things to sort of start recognizing. And then as they're reaching the adult status, I think it's really important to start making sure that you have a summary of the medical care. No adult provider is gonna want your binder. <laughs> your binder of everything that you've ever gone through, printed out notes, what you need is a summary of the medications that have been tried, the side effects, when they took it, that's gonna help the prior authorization uh, process, and what comorbidities and who's managing those. If there's comorbidities, you might need to set up additional care providers in the adult world for those. Um, and then it's important to know that once they reach 18, we can't talk to the parents anymore. It's, you know, it's that simple. So unless there's documentation allowing proxy that we can communicate, this is a real problem, especially for Klein Levin, because when they're symptomatic, who's gonna advocate for them? So we bend the rules, but you know, like we're not supposed to, and it's, it's really, it makes things very uncomfortable. And now you're in adult transition care. I think you have to make sure you, you know your health insurance plan. That's the number one thing. Anne-Marie had mentioned this, but the medications might change now. <laughs> and you need to know what it is. It's not your doctor's fault. The, medic, the game has changed. We need to know it and make sure that you have your health insurance card information um, and uh, the phone numbers that we're supposed to call because it honestly prior authorizations even once you get to the right number taken about you know 30 minutes to an hour if we don't know the insurance we don't have the correct number we you know it can you're just going to go to the bottom of the list the, the first call will hopefully will not be helpful um, and then you know make sure that if your primary care physicians are changing too that we have the appropriate communication with them so in conclusion, idiopathic hypersomnia and Klein Levin, I hope, I hope I emphasize that these really are adolescent conditions and really needs to be started to be talked at at that level. So educating the public and healthcare providers who touch this group, I think is really important. Um, management from the family, school, healthcare providers, everyone needs to be aligned to support patients. We certainly need better pediatric treatments. It's a struggle. And um, just as Anne-Marie had said, there's a ton of resources out there. These are a few of them, um, and I hope you take advantage of them. Thank you.